sustainability and equitable services. But to begin, I, I have to talk a little bit about the, uh, the origin and focus of environmental ethics, which began in the, uh, as a distinct area of philosophy and ethics, in particular in the early 1970s, probably with this paper, and has since uh, grown to be uh, a major uh, part of philosophy, with many uh, uh, philosophers focusing particularly on environmental ethics. has several journals, like environmental ethics is the uh, oldest. And um, rather early on, uh, it, it led in two directions, more directions than that, but two of relevance here. Uh, one is the area that's often in philosophical terms called moral considerability of individuals. Uh, that, that is the idea that for ethical or moral reasons we can't just treat an individual animal or in some cases plant as we wish as an instrument for human uh, uh, well-being, but they have their own intrinsic value. And this area in turn led to uh, the development of uh, animal rights movements and aspects of animal welfare movements. Uh, at roughly the same time, the, um, the field uh, developed uh, a large section devoted to the idea that not only individuals, but collective entities, and especially species, animal species, and uh, to some philosophers, plant species, are themselves morally considerable, and we have to take their their own uh, 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 existence into account. We can't just treat them as instruments. And this idea came to be known usually as, as intrinsic value. And some very prominent philosophers specialize in the area of intrinsic value. The uh, the term biodiversity first arose in the uh, 19, uh, late 1980s, but it had antecedents. Uh, you know, in particular, yeah, in particular, uh, these two books use the term biological diversity in the same way. So they express the totality of life on Earth, but in all cases, including. Uh, term biodiversity, primarily focusing on species, on different species and the many different species that exist. Um, often the, the, uh, the Rio summit is viewed as the, uh, as the, the real signal event in, in bringing the concept of biodiversity to, uh, to, to public attention. Um, but I would argue that very early on, uh, including in the Rio Earth Summit, uh, it introduced, uh, to use an American metaphor, the worm into the apple by focusing, uh, it mentions intrinsic value, but focused primarily on what biodiversity does for humans. All about humans. They can promote sustainable development for humans. Uh, that is, it's, more than plants, animals, and organisms, and everything about people and their various needs. And um, the convention and, and the associated uh, uh, phenomena have continued to focus increasingly on biodiversity as an instrument for human well-being and advancement. So, for example, these are the, the uh, logos of the last two International Days of Biodiversity, you can see that about sustainable development, sustainable people, and the livelihoods. Nothing whatsoever about intrinsic value, moral considerability, and other species. The idea of ecosystem services um, arose primarily in the 1970s. This was the, probably the most important early paper by Walt Westman who describe the many things that ecosystem, uh, ecosystems do for humans and, and began the uh, attempt to, to put economic value on them. Um, 
But as you can see here, at the outset, Westman was, was skeptical that large parts of the value of ecosystems could be captured in this way. He, he gave this uh, epigraph of a poem from Wordsworth, and he said there are many uh, aspects of ecosystems that deal with qualities of economy that is not placed a quantitative value. And at the very end, he said in the long run, these quantitative estimates of the value in economic terms uh, can only be asymptotic to the value expressed by Wordsworth and the poet. So he recognized the issue here. Um, this book by the Ehrlichs, um, four years later, was all about the things that biodiversity does for, uh, for human life. <coughs> the consequences of extinction, but it was about extinction of species. It was all about the things that individual species or groups of species did for, for humans. And uh, they, they recognized that, of course, there are many species for which it's not obvious what they do for humans. And yet, their project was to advance the idea that we have to save species at the winter extinction. And thus was born their famous rivet copper hypothesis. They said, look, consider an ecosystem to be like an airplane, and the rivets in the wings to be like the species. And suppose there's a man, rivet copper here, who is removing rivets. He said, well, it we removes one, it won't matter, it removes the other, it won't matter. But eventually, we removes the 21st or 42nd river, the whole plane will crash. So that's, that's, that's the way an ecosystem is. Even if we don't know exactly what each species does, some may just be insurance policies for countries that other species uh, cost. But eventually, we will remove the species and the whole ecosystem will found it. Um, but the important thing is they recognize that by, by, by pointing to the importance of biodiversity, in terms of what it can do for humans, it created a problem with respect to species that don't have any obvious benefit to humans. Um, uh, Gretchen Daly, who was an uh, airway student, then uh, you know, uh, edited this important book about all about ecosystem services. And, and for her, what, what biodiversity does for humans is not about species. It's all about ecosystems. It's all about what ecosystems do for humans. So the focus has shifted from species, as in the early area book, to ecosystems. Um, now, the, um, uh, the inculcation of, of uh, economic thinking and terminology, of course, is much, much older than Westman and Ehrlich's and Daly. You know, Darwin famously used the term the economy of nature in the origin of species. But the important thing here is he was using the economy as a metaphor. It was about costs and benefits to species, not in, 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 in dollar or real terms, but in terms of, of uh, energy, nutrients, resources, etc. It was metaphoric. Um, and subsequently, there have been uh, many uses of the framework of economic models, such as this one, that are also metaphoric. That is, they look at resource pools and costs and benefits, but in terms of energy or of, of, of nutrients or, or both. And so they're metaphors, the, the, the economic models. Uh, here we have uh, a very important paper by Bob Costanza. That's not metaphoric. This is about the value of, of ecosystem services in real dollars, $33 trillion. Although these authors did not say this is the only value of nature or ecosystems, it came to be used often, you hear people say, well, we know the value of nature. This is the value of nature $30 trillion. So this is not metaphoric. Um, 
And uh, in Gretchen Daly's uh, later book, The Newly Economy of Nature, I think some book of this sort was inevitable at this time, because once there's a, an economic value to nature or the conservation of biodiversity, uh, it's a very short step to seek to make it profitable for someone. <laughs> and so I think a version of this book would have, it was inevitable once nature was valued or ecosystem services were valued. And in the terms, that is that you use Darwin's term, the economy of nature, which is well known, but she's using it not as a metaphor, but literally the economy of nature. Um, and I think the uh, uh, apotheosis of this uh, change in, in the view of nature as a, uh, from the economic terms and in terms of what it can do for humans uh, came with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which more or less engraved the idea of ecosystem services and different classes of services for humans. Uh, in the minds of conservationists, environmentalists, everywhere. And nowhere in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is there any discussion of intrinsic value of species of in, that, in their own way, or any duty we have to preserve them in their own way. It's all about services for humans. So, why do we care about biodiversity? Why do we worry about its loss? We worry because it's essential for ecosystem services and human well-being. Nothing about you know, any ethical or moral concern here. Of course, um, biodiversity itself is not in the area of ecosystem service, but it underpins the four categories of ecosystem services that I'm sure most of us you know, are supporting cultural regulating and provision. So it's an underpinning, it's not a service itself. Another, and, and all of it is to lead through these various uh, phenomena to well-being for humans, not well-being for anything else, well-being for humans. Um, another important point is that uh, of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is the, is the view that biodiversity uh, Really, to some extent, biodiversity itself uh, actually leads to a service, especially in civilian services. But usually, it's leading to a um, uh, to a service for humans through a process, and the process has, comes about because of the functioning of ecosystems. You know, it may be the flow of energy, it may be the cycling of water or nutrients or what have you. So there's a tremendous focus on processes rather than on species per se and on biodiversity per se. And they are all leading to human well being. Well, the recognition that, that the, the, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment focuses on processes that led many conservation biologists and others to recognize that there's an issue here. The same one that Ehrlich's were grappling with back in 1981, and that is, well, suppose species, particular species, don't contribute to any ecosystem function that's important to any ecosystem service. And this led then to a, a possibly 25-year uh, domination of much of ecological research by an attempt to link biodiversity per se, simply the number of species, to various ecosystem functions. And for a good while, for example, any funding by the European Union for ecology could only be for studies on the relationship of biodiversity to ecosystem function. There are different views of the real uh, ultimate value of this tremendous expenditure of, of, of effort and of resources. And so, for example, here's a, 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 a review that argues that it really didn't help conservation at all. And here's a recent one that says, oh yes, it shows that uh, 
that biodiversity per se is really important. I, I think everyone agrees that uh, much of this research showed the actual importance of particular species to particular ecosystem functions, but I think that uh, there's tremendous debate about whether it really showed that the number of species per se in nature really matters. There's little doubt that an ecosystem with four species probably has greater function than one with one or two, but in nature there's not real evidence that an ecosystem with 213 species is more functional than one with 209 species. So this is a sort of a controversial uh, uh, research project, and it's the only one I know of that, where the academic scientific project was driven by a perceived um, political need almost to justify saving species that don't have particular <coughs> evident uh, functions that a humans may play. Um, well, with the the advent of ecosystem service type thinking and one ecosystem assessment, it was again inevitable that conservation biology would, uh, would seem to be a refocus of so traditional modern conservation biology, which originated in the 1970s from the confluence of uh, ecologists working on very small populations and geneticists also working on uh, uh, genetic problems and <coughs> populations sort of came together and formed this new field of conservation biology. But it, it's focused on species, on small populations, particular species. And the literature has had been through the 70s, 80s, 90s, right into the millennium, uh, uh, frequent references to things like intrinsic value and the, the ethical underpinning and environmental ethics, and that's not what ecosystem services are about. So it was inevitable that someone would come up with a notion that uh, we need a new conservation science, and someone turns out to be Peter Creek with Michelle Marvier, there's a paper that uh, sort of captures their ideas about what conservation science should do as opposed to what it's doing. And notice the I said the core principle, it's all about working landscapes, the corporate sector, human rights and duties, um, human well-being, and the idea that well, we can simultaneously maximize biodiversity on one hand, human well-being on the other, um, and ecosystem services. Here is their, this is their, their book uh, uh, you know, about how we should teach conservation science now. And notice the subtitle, Balancing the Needs of People and Nature. People first, nature second. Another interesting thing is, what would they construe nature to be? You know, it, it, it could be a scene from San Carlos, actually. <laughs> You know, it's, it's crops, which is This one's not as much in focus, but it's clearly not what we normally consider nature. So they have a different view of what nature is, and they're often quite explicit about it. As part of their attempt to refocus conservation science, they say, hey, you know, the, uh, our long-standing uh, attempts to, to save biodiversity hotspots is misguided. And there's lots of good things about biodiversity cold spots that don't have many species, but that do many things for humans. And the focus is on humans. So, of course, this turns out to be very controversial to bring up preservation, etc., etc. But the important point is it's a very different view, and it's a view away from biodiversity per se, towards ecosystem services for humans. Um, very specifically, these are quotes from their book, this is a paraphrase, but 
the whole idea that the, the conservation science is having the nature for human benefit, which is pretty much what the Millennium Ecosystem assessment is. Nothing about intrinsic value. Yeah. I think maximizing, trying to maximize biodiversity without compromising development. And that should and did raise red flags. I mean, we all recognize that it's not impossible to maximize more than one thing. This is empirical. And uh, again, they should increase the focus on urban areas and landscapes and species that are useful to humans. So not without much of nature and certainly not about intrinsic value. Um, well, it was inevitable also that once this uh, proposal for a new conservation science arose, there would be tremendous reaction from conservation scientists. And uh, probably the most thoroughgoing criticism was from a Caribbean's own student, Van Gogh, and his colleagues. And it was all about what they see as wrong with the Carita and RBA new conservation science. And there are really four things that they, they view as misguided um, premises of the new conservation science. One is the new conservation science argues that, that in the old conservation science um, uh, favored biodiversity to say over human welfare. I would argue that the matter is true of development. And I would argue to some extent that's true. Um, so the old conservation science rests on a myth of pristine nature and tries to restore the current state. And I would argue that that's false and I'll go into that in a moment. Um, Karina and Marvier say that actually nature is very resilient to recover from all sorts of insults like deforestation or drought or what have you. So nature isn't really fragile. But in thinking about that, think carefully of what they view as nature. <laughs> Remember those two pictures that I showed you from my cover of their textbook. That's what nature is. And finally, they argue that the old conservation has failed, we still see ecosystem degradation and uh, extinction. And you know, to an extent, to a large extent, that's true. But the question is, do we see less of it than we would have had there been no conservation biology? And will their view help to prevent ecosystem degradation and extinction? Um, in any event, the new conservation science uh, became very closely associated with a, a, a major buzzword that we've already heard, novel ecosystems. This is sort of the, uh, the original uh, major paper on what novel ecosystems are. And here is uh, Arvind Vedic's The New Normal uh, on Mars. And uh, this paper argues it is the new ecological world order whatever that means, because large parts of the Earth have been irrevocably transformed into basically anthropogenic landscape and ecosystems, primarily by introduced species and increasingly will be by climate change and by other anthropogenic activities, especially introduced species. And maybe that's not so bad, because some of these can provide us with ecosystem <coughs> services that we need. And so their argument, which is aimed at, uh, at restoration cultures, we should stop trying to restore uh, ecosystems to some previous state, but we should try to facilitate the, uh, the persistence of, of certain novel ecosystems that provide services for humans. And very, very closely associated with the, the very premises of the new conservation science, because you know it, it, the novel ecosystem literature says virtually the same thing. That um, you know, here, novel ecosystems are paying attention to human well-being and uh, progress. Uh, that argues that restoration ecologists have been focusing on trying to recreate something that can't be recreated 
and uh, you know, possibly never really existed as a historical. It argues again that nature, this time nature being the model record system, is uh, not fragile, but is, is uh, resilient to various changes. And again, here they're focusing primarily on restoration, but very scale is still the ecosystem degradation. Uh, well, one can imagine that this was an enormous reaction by many restoration ecologists who didn't think they were failing and disagreed with these premises, and so it led to a, a spitting match, as we say in America. Uh, I was one of the authors of this paper that critiqued all of these premises. Here's a response to us, here's our response to them. There's a large literature now about this. But suffice it to say that novel ecosystems, with their focus on ecosystem services for humans, is, uh, is really part and parcel of the new conservation science. And it's become a very dominant part of the environmental science of conservation in general. Part of the argument has been and continues to be the actual definition of uh, what do we really mean by a novel ecosystem? The, uh, <coughs> this is the extensible definition from the textbook by Hobson and Carlotters. So it's a physical system that's uh, non-analog, differs from those that prevail correctly, as a tendency to self-organize and maintain its novelty. Self-organize and persist by itself. Um, and exactly what that means is it's hard to say because we know that all ecosystems and the biotic communities within them uh, over time evolve and change. And some species arise, some disappear, the various uh, uh, fractions of, of, the, of, the, uh, of biomass that of course, each one differ from time. And, and many things happen, so it's an evolving entity anyway. So really, any ecosystem might be viewed as novel, because it uh, had a tendency to self-organize the novelty. And 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 Hobbes, you know, even in this way, uh, arbitrary, all of the different novel and appropriate context. So, it's hard to know what this entity is that we're even discussing. But, but the key point is that it's different, that it's greatly modified by human activities, and that it provides, or the ones we want to save or foster, provide ecosystem services in the remains of us. In the discussion about what this entity is and how we know it <laughs> See it, uh, another term has frequently arisen, hybrid ecosystem, which um, doesn't seem very different from a novel ecosystem, uh, except it doesn't have the required tendencies to self organize. So we should uh, examine closely the, uh, the, the, the claims about novel ecosystems. First of all, the argument that, you know, by Morris and others, are they the new normal? Are they inevitably ubiquitous and attempting to, uh, to prevent their advent is just a waste of effort? And instead, we should focus on saving the ones that are useful. Well, again, since we don't know exactly what one is and what one isn't, um, we don't know what to it's hard to say. It's quite good to say that in large parts of the Earth there are ecosystems that have not been great. large parts of the Earth, ordinary secondary succession has returned large areas to a quite close semblance of what had obtained before humans were on the scene. For example, much of eastern North America forests would be in that category. And there are also many activities of um, of restoration ecologists that have been quite successful. Many have failed also, but, but there are many successes. It's a young 
and it feels it's not obvious that this is an inevitable uh, fact. Secondly, uh, have, have these ecosystems cross irreversible boundaries so that we will never be able to restore them to any way and we have to deal with them. Again, it's hard to say without being able to say that we have this as a specific novel ecosystem, but you can see what's happening here. Here we have the latest version scheme and some of these thresholds we can't go back to here too. If there's enough change, never do the actors actually get labels. You know, numbers, they're never quantified, either the ordinate or the obsessive, they're always labeled. But the idea is, if they're different enough, you can't go back. Well, of course, if the species are extinguished, uh, in some way, it's uh, irreparable. But in terms of many other aspects, including ecosystem function, it's not so obvious it's irreversible. I would argue it's whether we want to devote the resources to doing it in the first place. Um, are these restoration activities fruitless and, and wasting resources? Um, this is sort of a, a statement that captures that sentiment in public science uh, five years ago uh, about how well we can't really get rid of introduced species in many places. So let's just forget it, call them native be done with it. Um, but in fact, there are many cases in the restoration and ecological literature in which introduced species have either been eradicated or have been brought under very substantial control by various means. And of course, now there's tremendous interest in uh, genetic approaches, especially gene drives and to some extent gene silencing uh, to deal with introduced species in various ways. So you know, I would argue that, that they're, they're wrong. There are many ways in which traditional uh, activities have been extremely fruitful. There's every reason to think that these technologies will get better and better. Do they self-organize and retain their integrity? Uh, there's no evidence that that's the case. If you think of agriculture, for example, it inevitably requires massive subsidies after a while, it's not really sustainable on its own. So this is a hypothesis of the years. There's no evidence for it. Has traditional restoration lost its constituency? Well, I mean, but there are many international and national projects that are founded explicitly on the idea of restoration, traditional restoration can work, and they could go lots and lots of resources to it. Here you, of course, know about the work. Atlantic, but there are many others. So I don't believe it's most of this constituency. And finally, I think there's some downsides to this whole uh, idea of the new conservation science and especially novel ecosystems. One is it, it sort of provides a um, get out of jail free card to uh, interests that destroy the landscape, pretty much of the sort that uh, Philip Burnside talked about earlier this morning, because they can say, and they are now saying in some cases, hey, it's okay, this is a novel ecosystem that's providing a service. So we shouldn't worry about the fact that we're destroying some ecosystem. Secondly, it's much of a corruption and, and total transformation of many conservation activities and organizations. Just to give an example that I know well, having been a member for 50 years almost. So the Nature Conservancy, the largest, the world's largest, certainly the best funded. The CEO is now an investment banker, Mark Churchill, who uses his book, Our Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature. And the question is what nature is and how they thrive. And the idea is to, that business thrives by profit. So it's all about the idea from Gary uh, Ellison's book, How to Make Nature Profitable. And you can see how it's transmogrified the Nature Conservancy into a totally different organization. Through 2011, this was the Nature Conservancy, this was its 
the picture that was on all of the publications, and this was their motto, Saving the Last Great Places, in 2011. Now, this is their mission, protecting nature for, why? for people today and future generations, for people. And this is the nature that they're protecting. Okay, so bear that in mind. And the nature of terms is one of several conservation organizations that have been, um, whose focus has been utterly changed by this uh, focus on ecosystem services and benefits <coughs> of humans. And I would argue this is their, their original model, and this should be their model. What they're doing now largely is helping industry to make the least environmentally bad choices when they're going to trash the landscape anyway. There are many, many projects that the Nature Conservancy helps them to figure out what's the least damaging thing to do, like the forest and the huge area of um, forest. And then Kamiko was, until very recently, the chief scientist of the Conservancy. And he is so much of that. Novel ecosystems in the value, invasive species, but they're okay, there's a whole lot of those species to be threatened and endangered. So it's a very, very different focus. Uh, lately, uh, there's been an attempt sort of to be ecumenical and say, well, we didn't really mean to get rid of all the traditional restoration and conservation. It still has some role. So here's an op ed in the New York Times by Maris. And by Applet, who's the, uh, the CEO of um, the Wilderness Society. And he says, well, these are going to be dominant, but there's still some role, maybe, for traditional conservation and restoration. Here's a more thoroughgoing uh, attempt by uh, my Hobbes and the Moody Hall authors to say, well, we're not really meaning to threaten existing conservation and existing restoration activities. Rather, we think that there's a role for it. And this is sort of what traditional restoration and conservation do. And there's various ways and ways to get to it. And the rest of this is model ecosystems, and they can coexist. So that's what we do. But many of the novel ecosystems have certainly become a very major uh, component in the ecological conservation literature. For example, the Outside of America annual meeting, which just ended the theme of model ecosystems in the Anthropocene. That was the focus. Um, and I'll close by returning to the, the monetization aspect, of putting economic value I would argue that it's a very, very slippery slope. And the reason is, once there's an economic value, there's bound to be attempts of profit, as was recognized early by Damien Ellison and by others. And um, once there's a market for aspects of nature, it leads to many, many problems. Um, so there are many conservation instruments like uh, offsets. So the offset here is that, that the conference is going to plant trees to counteract the carbon impact of people like me having <laughs> to Brazil. But it's the carbon impact. It's not biodiversity. It's about carbon, which is you know, very close to a certainly ecosystem. Market and very, very close in many cases to the economic market. Um, and also payments for ecosystem service. So, red is undoubtedly, that is the uh, reducing emissions of deforestation, forest degradation, is, uh, is an important uh, payment for ecosystem services. But there's, there's quite a literature on this. It's important, and incidentally, it certainly does save some biodiversity. But which biodiversity is a question, and where the payments go, and who benefits from them, even in human terms, is a question that we need to 
it's, it's very clear that we focus on services and not payment for services and markets for services. It's not going to say all of nature. There are many species that still provide no ecosystem service that humans want. And there's a long literature showing in particular that many threatened species and endemic species fall in this category. The contribution to any service is really minimal. Um, nor do they really contribute substantially to the viability of an ecosystem to provide the service. If they disappear, the ecosystem can still exist and would provide the service. And there are many ecological processes that humans don't want. Uh, Dalva talked at length about one, fire. And he talked about, the, about how fire is uh, inimical to many human endeavors, which it is. But fire is also very important for continued existence of many species. For example, in the southeastern United States and other places where there are fires as climaxes. Um, hydrological uh, uh, changes are, are another. But there, there are many kinds of processes that are you know, flooded that, that humans don't want, but that many species require. So, I'll close by returning to my opening metaphor of the Trojan horse, or the word of the apple, so to speak. Ecosystem services, I think, are, are quite dangerous and have already shown to be dangerous, have been shown to be dangerous to preservation of biodiversity, per se. Um, by virtue of redefining nature to be whatever species provide the services we want, Remember those pictures from the new conservation commons. And they also make species fungible, so that it doesn't really matter what species provides the service, be it a provisioning service, you know, or any other kind of service. If we get the service, the species itself doesn't matter. So it, it lessens the concern about the extinction of particular species. And the monetization exacerbates the problem because it makes all service providers fungible, interchangeable. And they can be species, they can be mechanisms, or they can have they can be techno fixes like dams or pumps. And so whatever provides the service most cheaply, if there's a market, it is, is best in terms of the market and profit from the market. And that of course is, is uh, the antithesis of the idea of intrinsic value and the importance of biodiversity for its own sake. Thank you.